the Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will hear. When the Savior calls, I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, if my robe is white, when he calls for me, oh, if my robe is white, I will hear. Oh, if my robe is white, oh, when he call me, oh, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere, somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Good morning, everyone. And those of you tuning in on YouTube, Facebook, good morning to you as well. It's good to be in the house of the Lord on another Lord's Day. No doubt about that. We're so very thankful that God, God showed us his grace and mercy this morning because I know that somewhere somebody went to sleep last night and they did not wake up this morning. So it is a blessing to be able to come into the house of the Lord just one more time. This morning, uh, this morning's lesson was inspired by one of my brothers. And, um, you know, oftentimes there are questions that people have or, or, or subjects that they would like to have uh, discussed in the Bible hour. So if you would submit to me what it is that you would like to understand or study more of, I would do my best to try to put a study together of it. So that way, nobody has to know that you wanted to know this and you get the answers that you needed to get. So that nobody has to feel embarrassed or anything like that, okay? So this morning, I want us to go to Daniel chapter 3, uh, beginning at verse 16. Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. Because sometimes when it gets... Uh, sometimes when circumstances are difficult, it can be tough to keep the faith. But God desires us to trust him, trust in him, and even if our prayers are not answered. So this is kind of going to be a three-part series. This morning is going to be entitled, Even If. Even If. So if you have your Bibles and you're at Daniel chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. This story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the fiery furnace of King Nebuchadnezzar is one that, is, uh, that many of us have heard since childhood. These three men were faithful followers of God. They refused to compromise and bow before the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had made. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, though they were captives in Babylon, they stood in front of the most powerful man of his time. And they boldly proclaimed that under no circumstances would they worship the giant image of gold 
towering above them. And I wonder, what have we bowed down to today? What have we bowed down to? What have we compromised our faith and bowed down to? Because we went along to get along. Now, these three men could have went along to get along. They didn't have to be thrown into the furnace. They could have went along with everybody else, just bowed on down and went on about their business. But their relationship with their God was more important than what was going on in the world. Their relationship with God was more important than what is going on in the world. We all get a chance every day to express if God is the most important thing in our life or not. Believe it or not, we do. I can give you some simple examples. Y'all not going to like them, but I'm going to give you some simple examples. Y'all never late for work, but you're late for church. Service, worship starts at 11 o'clock. Y'all come in here 11.30, quarter to 12. I see people come in when they're giving out the communion. That means you done missed the whole lesson of the day. You didn't hear a word from God. You just came in and took communion. You didn't hear a word from God. If God was the most important thing in your life, he'd matter more to you than that boss. You'd be on time for God. He's on time for you. He's on time for you. But together, these three men declared, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. And here goes the next statement. But even if he does not, we want you to know we will not worship the image. These three men were thrown into the fiery furnace and God miraculously delivered them. They were prepared to die, but their trust was unconditional. Even if, even if, I know I'm praying for this, but even if God doesn't give me what I'm asking for, am I still going to serve him? Even if he doesn't give me what I'm asking for, am I still going to be true to him? Even if he doesn't give me what I've asked him for, am I going to be faithful to him? We're going to discuss this even if concept. These boys knew that it was possible that they would be killed for not obeying the king's order. And yet they remain loyal to God. And sometimes you got to choose. Am I going to be loyal to God or am I going to be loyal to man? Are the pressures that man putting on me, are they going to cause me to compromise and not be loyal to God? We're going to be tested like that. You may not be tested with, 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 with the death, but you're going to be tested somewhere about your faith in that area. As a whom are you going to be more loyal to? Thank you, Brother Roy. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were ready to serve God regardless of the circumstances. I don't know if we can all say that. We're ready to serve God regardless of all the circumstances. Because if five gunmen ran through that door right now with machine guns and said, everybody that love Christ, love Christ I'm going to kill them, how many people would run out this back door? Or how many would sit there? How many would sit there? I'm not so sure that we're always ready regardless of the circumstances. But God takes care of his own, doesn't he? God takes care of his own. I've heard some of you come up here with certain circumstances you was in, and you still remain today because God took care of you. God takes care of his own. Look at verse 25. Look at verse 25. Uh, for those that just came in, we're in Daniel chapter 3, and we're going down to verse 25. When King Nebuchadnezzar looked in that fire, he said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. They have no hurt, and the former the fourth 
is like the Son of God. Now, let me ex explain this because I've heard many people misinterpret this. So let me set you straight on it. When he said the sons of God, he didn't mean he saw Jesus in there. That's not what this means. If you will reflect, the angels were called the sons of God because of their excellency. Therefore, the king called this angel whom God sent to comfort uh, his own in this great torment, the son of God. That's who the son of God is. It's not Jesus in that fire. And the son of God is an angel that God sent to comfort his own. And sometimes when you're going through some things and then you get that peace, calmness across you, who oh God sent his name, he sent to take care of his own. He said he would send the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. That's what happens to you. You get that comforting. You get that comforting. In verse 28, the Bible said, God has sent his angel and delivered his servants. Didn't say he sent Jesus. It said he, did, he said he sent his angel and delivered his servants. Verse 28. Is that what it says in your Bible? He said he sent his angel and delivered his servants. That part where it said, where the king said, walking in the midst of fire. He saw an image of the godly but they were unhurt. In the midst of trouble, in Psalms, look at Psalms 138, verse 7. Psalms 138, verse 7. Psalms 138, and the verse there is 7. The Bible says, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt Stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. God can save you in the midst of your troubles. He says, though I walk in the midst of my troubles, will God revive me? God takes care of us in the middle of our troubles. Takes care of us in the midst of our troubles. I want you to know, because of that part of Scripture, that you don't walk alone when things are going on in your life. Oh, it may seem that way to you at first, but you're never alone. Christ's presence is always there. Um, they walked up and down in the fire, and they didn't leave it, um, but they were waiting for God's time to bring them out. Just as Jesus waited in the tomb as God's prisoner till God should let him out. So Paul, when he had the thorn in his flesh, he prayed three times to have it removed. But it wasn't until God's time. So was Noah waited in the ark after the flood till God brought him out. And so sometimes we have to wait until God brings us out of our situation. Sometimes it's, it's beyond your control. There's nothing that you can do to pull you out that situation. You have to wait on God to pull you out of that situation. Remember Christ said, in due time, and we must always remember, due time, that's God's time, due time. We don't know when due time will be, but when due time comes, we know he's going to deliver us. That we can guarantee. Those who suffer for Christ have his uh, gracious presence with them in their sufferings, even in the fiery furnace, even in the valley of the shadow of death, therefore you need to fear no evil. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2 and following, the Bible says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. God protects his own. God looks after his own. Now, life's not a bouquet of roses. Because in Psalms 34, verse 19, the Bible says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Many afflictions. That means you're going to have to go through some things. 
you're going to have to go through something. Many are the afflictions. Many. More than one. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the beauty is, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. We all go through difficulties. Nobody is exempted from going through difficulties. Problems are a part of life. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, the Bible says, Jesus said that it rains on the just and the unjust. So don't look at your friend who, who's not a Christian, who don't go to church, period, don't even believe in God, and look like they keep getting prosperity or good things happen to them. The, Bi the Bible says that Christ said that it rains on the just and the unjust. Now, you know, you, what you get down here is nothing compared to what you'll get in heaven. And so some people, some people will live comfortably down here and won't be able to get through the gate. Everything, everything we do has a consequence. Not being in Christ when judgment day comes will keep you out of the gate, will keep you on the outside of the gate. I don't, I don't really mind being poor here because I'm going to be rich there. And there is what we all working to, to get to, is there. It doesn't matter how much or how little I have here. I just want to know, can I get in there? That's the question. Because when you get to the gate and they open up the book of life, nobody's going to ask you, um, how much money did you have down there on earth? How many houses did you have? How many cars did you have? What did you drive? That won't matter. That won't matter. But that matters to some people so much today that they're not worried about their soul for tomorrow. Being a person of faith doesn't exempt us from the trouble of life. Every problem has a dual nature. Because your problem can either draw, it can either draw us closer to God or separate us from him. That's what problems can do. It'll draw you closer to God or separate you from him. Because the person who says, oh, God, why is this happening to me? They ain't too happy with God. <laughs> they're not too happy with God because they don't want to be going through what they're going through. And so they get agitated and they get mad at God because they're going through something. Whereas the Bible teaches us that when you go through diverse temptations to count it all joy. Now, it takes you a while to get to that position. When you go through diverse temptations to count it all joy, that takes, oh, it takes time. Thank you, Brother Wright. It takes time to get to that position. Because when I got home from work on May 12th, and four minutes after I was in the house, they called me and said, you are no longer required to come to work. I wasn't counting it all joy at that moment. Oh, no, I wasn't too happy. I, I wasn't too happy. I had to calm down for a minute to count it as all joy. I said, okay, Lord, this is wrong, but there's something else you got for me. This is good. This is good. But you, that ain't the first place that you run to. <laughs> you don't run to count it all joy. You know, when, 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 the, when my car was parked on the street and the guy ran into it and totaled it and he knocked on my door and said, come downstairs, something happened to your car. When I saw my car, the first thing I did, not smile and count it all joy. That ain't the first, I'm be honest, that wasn't the first thing I did. It's not the first thing I did. That takes time to build up in you to be able to count it all joy when you go through diamonds temptation. It takes time. When some believers are facing trials, they give up their faith in God. I wonder how many people gave up their faith when this COVID started. I wonder. I wonder, I sometimes wonder, the faces that we don't see here on Sunday morning, are we ever going to see those faces again? I wonder. I wonder. They stopped praying. 
They stop attending church. They stop giving to the church. And they stop reading the Bible. But it ought not to be so. The purpose of life itself is in solving problems. Somebody's even going through their problems right now. Right now as I speak. It may be in your marriage. Could be in business. Could be in health. Could be in ministry. Could be in a relationship. Could be at your job. Could be at your school or finances. Well, that statement just, just summed up my whole week. <laughs> because I had a little bit of all of that. All of that this week. But the good thing was, I told people to hold fast until Friday. Because the praise party ain't over until Friday. So I couldn't get in touch with unemployment for two weeks. Y'all probably know how that is. You can't get through to file your claim. I got rent to pay. And then, then all of a sudden, I got an angel on the phone Wednesday after two weeks. Now I got my claim started. I thank God. I need a little help with my rent money. That came through plus some. I said, but the praise party ain't over. Wait until Friday. And the job that I wanted, with everything I wanted, the man called me at 310 and said, it's yours. Come in Tuesday. The praise party started Friday. <laughs> they that wait upon the Lord, you've got to wait on him. You've got to trust him. You just, if you just wait on him, he'll, he'll come through. He will come through. He'll show up for his children. There was no doubt in my mind that he wasn't going to take care of me. There was no doubt in my mind. And you know, every problem has an expiration date. Problems don't last forever. Every problem has an expiration date. And don't ever, don't ever make a, a permanent uh, how's it? A permanent solution to a temporary problem. That's when people commit suicide. It was a temporary problem, and they made a permanent solution. They took themselves out of here. Don't ever do that. Every problem has an expiration date. The world says all good things must come to an end. Y'all heard that before. All good things must come to the end. For the Christian, you should be saying, all bad things must come to an end. Because when my Jesus steps in, that's when it's going to end. That's when it's going to end. The Bible calls it our light affliction in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. And this light affliction is but for a moment, for a short time, and then it will be gone. It's also written... That we've been may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And that's, that's what a lot of people hold on to to get them through. It's, it's something that you should hold on to. Just always, I just want everybody to, I say it many times, I'm going to say it again this morning. I really want you to understand that Psalms 35. Weeping may endure for a night, but the Bible don't tell you how long your night going to be. You might have to weep, weep for six months before your joy cometh in the morning. You may have to weep, weep for six weeks before your joy cometh in the morning. The guarantee is your joy is coming in the morning. But the Bible don't tell us how long our night's going to be. And that's what you got to remember about that. You got to remember about that. No storm lasts forever. Uh, the wind will stop blowing and the battle will end. The rain will stop and your sun will shine again. Don't give up in your trials. Don't give up. The, the, the night will soon be over. In Psalms, chapter, uh, Psalms 50, chapter 15, the Bible says, And call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. And we must be very careful about that. Because sometimes when people come up out of something, they take all the credit. Yeah, I, I, I did this and I did that. And it all becomes, the narrative becomes I. Instead of you telling people, God help me. God gets all glory in my story. God help me this week. 
He took care of everything I needed to be taken care of. And then some. I asked for a little bit. He said, listen, I'm a big God, man. You had me for a little stuff. I'm going to give you this. God is a big God. That's the first time in a long time I asked God for a little something. Because I usually ask for a big something. I always ask for big something. I got a big God that I serve, not a little one. And so God says, call on me in your day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. That's important. Remember to give God the credit for bringing you out of something, for bringing you through something. Give God the credit. Don't say I, I this and I that. Give it to God. And so these three boys, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they had an unconditional faith. Sometimes when circumstances are difficult, it can be tough to keep the faith. But God desires that we trust in him, even if our prayers are not answered. Even if. We must never let our trust in God become conditional because we don't see his goodness. Faith is trust in God even when it doesn't make sense. Abraham had to wait for 25 years before he saw Isaac. Soon afterwards, God tested his faith and asked him to sacrifice his son. Abraham obeyed. He showed that he had unconditional trust. He had unconditional trust. He, he was just obedient to the word of God. When God saw it, he was excited to reward his obedience. See, God gets excited to reward your obedience to him. He gets excited then. And that's why when the praises go up, the blessings come down, because he's excited about your obedience. Even in the midst of your trouble, you're still obedient. Even though the enemy is painting this picture to you that it's all over. You can't win. But you still are obedient to him. God rewards people for that. Remember Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. He who comes to God must believe that he is. And then it says, he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. When you're obedient to God, he rewards you. When you have unconditional faith in God, you can never be frustrated. Faith believes in God regardless, uh, regardless of the circumstances. Now, what is unconditional faith? Unconditional faith is a faith in God that's not subject to any condition. Well, if God does this for me, yeah, then, then I'll believe in him. I have faith in him if he, if he does this for me. But the condition is God has to do something first before you do something. Um, it is to trust God without limitation or reservation. Unconditional faith is total faith in God. You have to have total faith in God that, listen, I say it all the time, but it's so true. Everybody sitting in this room has a track record with God. He's brought you over many hurdles to this present time. When something else comes up in your life, you should be able to look in the recesses of your mind and know that God was there for you all these other times. Why wouldn't he be there now? We all should have that total recall. We should have that absolute trust. Unconditional faith is a complete trust in the Lord. You got to have trust in the Lord if you're Abraham and you're going to raise, you've been asking for the son, you waited 25 years to get him. And, and then God said, take this knife and kill him. And you get so much as you raise the knife up and, it gets, and then you get stopped. That's true, that's trust in God. Unconditional trust is believe in God when we don't understand or see what he's doing. When God is setting you up, you may not understand the steps he's taking. That's why you can't look at everything that happens to you as just being, oh, oh, it's so bad. You see, at first, listen, I got fired. But it was a blessing. So what they meant for bad, God meant for good. Because he put me in a better place, making more money, having more responsibility, more skill. I, it's, it's just overwhelming me how great it is. It's just overwhelming how great it is. But see, some of us are like, 
like, like, look, some of us are like this here. You put that, you put that $20 bill in your hand and you make this fist. And, and you can't get any, you can't get in there. You can't get in there. You got $20. But also, God can't put nothing better in there. Because you got a clenched fist. In order for you to get the blessing, you got to let something go. To get something better, you got to let something go. So sometimes you get removed from places because he's about to move you to another place. So don't be so upset because it's part of the setup. It's part of the setup. Unconditional trust is blind faith in God and his promises. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego trusted God unconditionally. They were committed no matter the outcome. Even if God chose not to deliver them the way they desired, they were determined to stand firm and be faithful. That's the proper attitude we should all have. It's not a matter of whether things turn out as we hope. The issue is whether we will be true to God if they don't turn out as we hope. That's the whole thing. And so, you know, some people, they leave God because what they asked for didn't come in a white box wrapped with a red ribbon. And so they walk away from God. Unconditional faith is to love God. We trust him because he loves us unconditionally. Now, I know he loves us unconditionally. Because I don't know how many times you messed up, but I know I messed up. And he didn't, you know, in the Old Testament, you did certain sins. He just, he did away with you. You got stoned to death or something. I know I messed up along the way, but I'm still here because of his unconditional love. Unconditional love. I know God loves me because he's long suffering with me. Because I'm not the person I'm supposed to be every day. Not every day. I fall and stumble just like each and every one of you. I fall and stumble too. But it's because of his unconditional love I can still stand here this morning and proclaim his word. So we all need to remember that God loves us unconditionally. And we have to have that unconditional faith in him. Um, my time is up this morning. But if you're not a child of God this morning, and you want to know about this even if principle, if you want to be one of God's children, that he can rescue you from the fiery furnace you may find yourself in this morning. It's very simple. God has made a way. You must hear the word. You must believe the word. You must repent of your sins. You must confess Christ. And then you must be baptized for the remission of your sins. You must be baptized to be added to the body of Christ. You must be baptized to be in Christ because that is the only way you can get in Christ is through baptism. If you do those five things, you can, too, become a child, child of God this morning. As we travel throughout the rest of this week, let's just remember, there's some things we're all praying about right now that we need God to help us in. But remember, like the three Hebrew boys, even if he doesn't do that, help me in that way, I still trust him. I'm still on God's side. I'm not going to walk away from God because he didn't do this or he didn't do that. Because he knows better than me why he should do it or why he shouldn't. All of us think that our prayers should be answered, but God knows best. No different than your child is fascinated with cars. And he got the little cars that he pushed on the floor at home. But you wouldn't give him the keys to your automobile outside, would you? Because you know it would do him some harm. God treats us the same way. You may think it's good for you but he don't think it's good for you. Thank you this morning.